Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, we have a number of announcements that are in the bulletin, and I'd like you to please pay attention to them. We're coming. This is that frantic time in the summer when everybody uh, in, and every church is trying to fit everything in that needs to be done before three weeks from now, and we'll probably have our first frost warning. So uh, yeah, uh, we've got a lot going on, and if you would uh, note, make notes on your calendar, uh, that would be really helpful. First of all, today is picture day, and I know I... I I know some of you really don't like having your picture taken, and, and on the one hand, I totally understand. My father was an engineer with Eastman Kodak, and uh, he was the senior supervisor of New Products Division at one point. It developed a little disc camera uh, that in the 80s, you may remember. He was taking pictures constantly, and movies constantly. And uh, it got to be where I'd hardly ever take them any, at all myself anymore, but it's really important, uh, and we would love it if you would please just take a moment on your way, if you haven't done it on the way in this morning, if on the way out, you would stop with your family, all the kids, and just quick, have a picture taken of your family. Uh, we want it for each other to have in the directory, but we also want it for the new pastor, and it's very conceivable that uh, <clears throat> the new pastor will be coming sometime in the next 12 months, and uh, this will be the document that we have uh, of our church family. And I can remember, I can remember personally that when I came here how, uh, 15 years ago, how important it was to me to have a pictorial reference, not just to see faces and names, but to see faces and families, to see who was related to who. Uh, that was a big help because it was difficult. Uh, uh, to always make all of those connections. It was harder in the days that I married Gail at Central Free Church down in Minneapolis when uh, there were basically three last names, Johnson and Peterson and Larson, and, and, and everybody had one of those names. But uh, it's not quite that hard here, but it's the same thing. So please take the time for the sake of your brothers and sisters here and the coming pastor that uh, the Lord will provide uh, to, to get your picture taken. This week we'll probably have it uh, up we may have it up again, but we'd love to have you do it this week. Second of all, the Christian Ed Committee has a meeting scheduled for Thursday, August 25th at 6 o'clock. Uh, if it's sunny, it's going to be at the picnic table uh, in the Fenston area. Uh, otherwise, it'll be in my office. Please, if you're on the Christian Ed Committee, very, very, very important meeting. Please see, um, make it to that. Uh, over in the back of uh, <clears throat> your bulletin, you'll also see an announcement for a baptism and fun day at Mink Lake. That's next week. After the worship service, we're going to go up to Coldwater Camp, the Coldwater's Camp at Mink Lake, Mink Lake Camp. And uh, we're first going to have a, um, a baptism service. And we have uh, two brothers, uh, young uh, men who are getting uh, uh, baptized, as well as uh, two of our uh, adult friends uh, who have uh, joined our congregation recently, and they're going to get baptized. So if, if you have thought about that or are thinking about that, and I'm going to be preaching about it this morning and would like to be part of that, please let me know. We'll have a baptism service, and then afterwards we're going to have a church fun day at the beach there at uh, Mink Lake Camp. We're going to ask that you bring a lunch, uh, a picnic lunch for your family to share and uh, with, with whatever it is you want to eat and drink. And uh, the church will provide some sort of ice cream dessert. So uh, the, this way we won't have to be organizing potluck and, and this, that, and the other thing. So that's next week. I hope that you will plan to do it. Also, you'll see in your, direct, or in your bulletin there's a card here to register on. This is to go with your, your photograph. Uh, just even if you've got an entry in the directory right now, please fill this out with all the information, and, uh, <clears throat> and then we'll know that we've had the right information in our directory. I always get a, some of the churches have these cards like this, and it uh, asks if you're a regular or uh, uh, just an attend a regular member or an attender, which I thought, I didn't know that all of our members were regular and all of our attenders were not, but that's, 
Uh, this card is important. Please fill it out with all the names and birth dates because it's so easy to get some of the information wrong uh, and we want to double check that. All right, that is all by way of announcements. Let me ask you to turn in your hymn book to the back page. The Apostles' Creed. It's a couple pages in. The Apostles' Creed in your hymn book. And this is set up to be read in unison, so we're going to read it together. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for the presence of your spirit here today. We ask, Lord, that you would help us. We are easily distracted and uh, there is so much out there that is distracting, both good and worrisome. And I pray that right now that you would give us the power to reject every thought that is not subjected to our hope in you and our obedience to you. Help us, Lord God, to be listening for your spirit to speak to us in something that is said, read, or sung. For we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> um, if you would turn with me in, in your hymnal into uh, hymn number four, How Great Thou Art, and you could stand with me and sing this. Um, thank you. I just want to say first that um, sorry, every time I start talking I want to cry. I don't know how you do it, Dave, but I'm not going to cry this time. Um, uh, but Andrea and I g had the opportunity to go out and camp by the uh, in the Grand Teton National Park um, a few weeks ago and it was amazing. It was um, so gorgeous and beautiful and refreshing um, and some but something that I realized is that as beautiful and gorgeous as that is and as beautiful and gorgeous as like the stars are I don't know if any of you guys saw the stars last night um, but uh, if we just take a look around at what God has made it is amazing um, and it should inspire our praise but then when I Sorry, I'm, I'm not good at this. But when I, when I um, am with the body, with the body of Christ, and not just the body of Christ, but with human beings and um, people in our community, um, that's so much more, so much more magnificent. And that's how God feels, and it's really, um, we. Humanity is the crown of God's creation. And I just think that we ought to be a people, especially in this community that glorifies creation, um, we ought to be a community, a body that acknowledges that God crowned his creation with humanity um, and that we are, we represent him and we are the image of God, in the image of God. And um, so I just ask that we think about that today as we sing How Great Thou Art.
Oh Lord my God When I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God His Son not sparing sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall in my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. And there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Let's sing verse 2 now, in light of all of that. When through the woods and forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur And hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee How great Thou art, 
how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art thank you you may be seated would you pray with me lord god we again thank you for the prosperity that you've given us the Ability to earn enough, Lord, that we are able to feed and clothe and shelter our families uh, and to uh, also have enough to uh, participate in the enterprise of the kingdom of God all over the world. We pray that you would take what we give, that you would teach us to be generous in our hearts and that you would glorify yourself, Lord God, because when you are glorified, all of creation is blessed. In Christ's name, amen. Search me, oh God, this is cleanse me, and know in the hymnal, in the hymnal, today, what's the number on that one? I try me, oh Savior, know my thoughts. I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. And set me free. You can stand if you want to. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill the Revival comes from thee, 
Send a revival, start the work in me. Thy word declares, Thou wilt supply our need for blessings now O Lord I humbly Do any of you have um, things that you know that the Lord has done this week? Um, do you have any relationships that you have with people that you've been reaching out to for years um, that you just see like the Lord did that in them and I, and I have hope that he is going to change them, that he's going to give them life. He's going to start his new life in them. Um, I have that. I, the Lord's been uh, faithful to uh, put me in relationships like that, um, and I'm grateful to him. Um, and I just ask that to, today, as we're singing this song, that you would think about the things that you really are praising the Lord for. These aren't just words that we're singing and nice music and nice um, sounding um, sections that we put together um, uh, just think about your own personal situations and, and um, feel free to be silent if you want to um, but let's just uh, praise the Lord for all that he is and all that he's doing in our lives because he is moving he is here Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Open up our hearts, let the living water give our lives a start. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise to Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Praise His name, praise His name, praise His name, praise His name and you will never be the same. Just 
star Praise His name Praise His name Praise His name And you will never be the same Praise His name Praise His name Praise His name And you will Peace, be still. Jehovah God is with you. Peace, be still. Jehovah is Lord. Peace, be still. Jehovah God is with you. Jehovah is Lord of all. Sing that with me. Peace, be still. Jehovah God is with you. Peace, be still. Jehovah is Lord. Peace, be still. Jehovah God is with you. Jehovah is Lord of all. the banner, raise it high, Father, glorify, glorify, glorify thy name, glorify Raise a banner, raise it high, Father, glorify. Jesus, light the flame. Jesus, light the flame. Jesus, light the flame. Give us passion for your name, Jesus, light the flame, glorify thy name, glorify thy name, this is a prayer, glorify thy name. Raise a banner, raise it high, Father, glorify, purify your bride, purify your bride.
purify your bride. Cleanse with your holy fire, Father. Purify, purify us, Lord. Glorify, glorify thy name. Sing it out. Glorify thy name. Raise a banner, raise it high, Father. There's a number of things to pray about uh, in our congregation today. Received word that uh, Linda Harsdorf has had an eye infection here recently that has um, uh, taken the sight of one of her eyes and the doctors aren't sure whether this is permanent or not. So we want to be praying for Linda. Uh, Amy and Andy uh, notified, got a hold of me here, and uh, Amy is in physical therapy for her back and responding well to it. The question that they all have is, will this be enough uh, for, it, it works great for living in Iowa, uh, but they're not sure that the recovery will be strong enough uh, uh, in, uh, in Iowa, and how will they know that? So that's a prayer request. And also, uh, they really, uh, when they went into this ministry, both tending to go to Tanzania and then going to um, Panama, in both cases, there was supposed to be a team that they were going to work with, and, and uh, now uh, what's actually happened is uh, it hasn't been a team. They have been uh, chief cook and bottle washer for just about everything uh, that was supposed to have been a shared ministry uh, with uh, uh, YWAM. And uh, they really, uh, they have a team in, in Simone, 
the man who is there that Andy is working with, but it, uh, they would really appreciate someone that would uh, team up with them as uh, cross-cultural missionaries in a uh, kind of foreigners in a foreign land. So we'd be praying about that. Um, and also uh, receive word that Elsa Sorensen has had a serious reversal in her liver transplant that is threatening the transplant and her well-being. Uh, so we'll be more on that as time comes, but that's something that uh, we need to hold up um, in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you are a God who commands us to love and then gives us a language of love uh, that we can take our love for one another in prayer to you. And though we would have everybody live long, healthy lives, Lord God, and and we want very much uh, uh, for frustrations to be eased. We want for paths to be made clear and plain. Uh, and yet, uh, Lord, you don't seem to work that way. There, is, there are gray and even dark times on the way to healing. And uh, outcomes are never uh, guaranteed. And so we come to you, Lord God, uh, in honesty, wanting you to hear our prayer for our friends and to please uh, do the good thing that we imagine for them, the thing that, that we could identify that we would want for them or for our children or for ourselves. So we lift them up to you. We lift up Lynn Harsdorf and ask for healing for her eye. We uh, lift up Andy and Amy Schmidt and ask for continued healing for Amy, as well as partners in ministry for them when they return, and clarity in your vision and your direction for their life, Lord God. We pray for Elsa. Uh, this is, a, th this is a, a kind of a gut punch uh, for the whole family and, uh, and for everybody who, who cares for them. And so we, we lift this up to you and we plead with you, Lord God, that you would hear our prayers and that you would uh, take this, uh, uh, this latest development and turn it over uh, and that there would be health and strength that would return to her uh, by your hand. Uh, we pray also uh, for uh, Jesse and for Vicki who are struggling with cancer and ask that you would give them courage and blessing in the midst and, and that every day would be an awareness uh, that this is a gift and that, that they would find joy in it uh, by, from your hand. And finally, Lord, we, we pray for our world uh, for the tremendous uh, uh, a double whammy of droughts, terrible droughts, in some places that are bringing, livers, uh, bringing rivers to their lowest point in centuries uh, or drying them up altogether. Uh, and, uh, or and in other places are, are flooding Death Valley of all places uh, where there are Niagara Falls of rivers flowing over precipices there from all the rain that has fallen. Lord Jesus, we, uh, um, we know that all of these things are in your hands. And again, we pray on behalf of our creation that you would continue to give the life-sustaining power that is necessary for all, those who believe and those who don't, that you would remember and graciously uh, restore the blessing of the balance and the harmony of our planet. Teach us how we would be uh, better stewards of that. Uh, and Lord, in all of this, glorify your name, lift your name up. The song that we had this morning prayed for revival, and that is what we pray for. And we pray specifically that you would make us ambassadors who are, if we're overwhelmed with anything, it is overwhelmed uh, with the same love that you have for your creation, and that we would plead with those around us, and that we would think to do it, that we would pray that you would give us names and opportunities to speak a word of gospel to people around us, people we work with, go to school with, live next door, people in our own family. Lord, let us be a blessing in your name and, and, and to preach the message, which is be reconciled to God. And uh, we will thank you and we will praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. 
Remember this portion of the story of God as is written in the book that we love from Romans 6, verse 4, and Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oops. <clears throat> Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Romans 6 is kind of the target verse for today only because it does mention baptism and, and we are headed towards a, a time of a baptism service next week. And I want you to think about it. If you've never been baptized, I'd like you to think about it. If this is a, an act of obedience uh, that you would like to follow through on, uh, we would love to uh, help you with that um, and to be a part of our service next week. Um, and, and because next week, as I said before, we are going to have a baptism service. Now, in our, <clears throat> our denomination and our tradition, uh, we are unsparing with the water. And uh, uh, we believe in a full immersion. Uh, and uh, we will be going out to Mink Lake to do that. And uh, we, uh, we also believe, along with the early church, that the most powerful symbol of baptism is not that of cleansing. That was the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. But the most powerful symbol of baptism is when we go down in the water, we participate in the death of Jesus Christ, symbolically. It is going into his grave with him. And when we come up out of it, it is a celebration of the resurrection. Leaving behind the old person that has died in the grave and coming anew, the new person that Christ has created and will resurrect in the last day. In Romans 6, chapter 4, Paul teaches us, Therefore we have been buried with Jesus Christ through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now again, in our tradition, our theology and spirituality, uh, baptism is not, does not initiate in, in, uh, a process in you so much as it reflects a process that you've already initiated with God on your own. So this isn't something we generally do with newborns, uh, although it's not forbidden in our denomination. This is something we believe in believer's baptism. You have at the uh, at an early point made a, a, a commitment to Jesus Christ to make him your Savior and your Lord, and baptism is an outward and dramatic act of prayer to reflect that. Baptism is not the end of a process, it's the beginning. You all know the joke about the bats in the church and how the Baptist pastor had bats in his church, wondering how to get rid of them, heard that the Lutheran pastor had gotten rid of the bats in their church, so he went to the Lutheran pastor and said, how do you get rid of the bats in your church? And he said, I baptized and confirmed them and haven't seen them since. And, and baptism is not a, 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 a end process. This is, it's a beginning of something that goes on and deepens and becomes more extraordinary as life goes on. It is a dramatic act of prayer the way we celebrate it. 
In it, we present ourselves to God, surrendered to His purposes and His will for our life. We cling to Jesus, symbolically entering the grave and death with Him when we are plunged under the water, and then rising with Him out of the grave into a new life when we are lifted out of the water. So what life are we lifted into? Paul calls it, he says that when we come out, we are lifted into newness of life, which is reflected up here. A new life has sprung up. It is this newness of life that Paul focuses on in today's reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Paul prays for the Ephesians and for us in verse 17. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And here, I want to make sure you understand that the glory of God is in what he's describing next. God is glorified by the fact that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? God is glorified by this. In other words, again, God's glory isn't like us. Something that, that pulls all eyes on us, that makes us the center of attention, that has our well-being first and foremost. And if anybody else get something good out of it, well, that's nice, but that's not the intention. When we glorify ourselves, our, we want all of it. We want it for ourselves. We want to radiate out. That's just not how God works. When he is glorified, he becomes the center of blessing for all creation. When God is glorified, all of creation is blessed. So when we, when we pray for his glory, we are praying we are putting down our own glory. We're putting down our own hopes and dreams, and we are attaching ourselves to him because his glory always brings blessing. Regardless of the route that it takes to get there, God's glory is something that is always good for us. Paul prays for the Ephesians and for us that God would create in us a spirit that is wise in what God has revealed. What he has revealed in Jesus Christ. What he's revealed in the Bible. What he has revealed in our lives together in the church and in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Such a spirit that is, a, that is wise in what God has revealed. Such a spirit that is wise in these things that sees that this is the center of everything. That is not full of itself, but full of the light that God's wisdom brings. Such a spirit is a spirit that will know abundant life. Paul prayed that in our heart and spirit we would be empowered by the knowledge that three gifts would bring. The gift of hope, the hope of his calling, the gift of a glorious inheritance, and the gift of of the surpassing greatness of God's power. First, the hope of his calling. Hope can be as simple as a vision or a picture of what is good and joyful for us. When we say, when we say that we've gone to our happy place, uh, that's a phrase that says we've gone to, to think about something that is happier than the circumstances that we're in right now so that we don't tell that person what we really think about them. Or we don't quit and give up and go home. Uh, but that we, it, it's, a, it's a little picture of a, of, of, a, of a hope or a dream that we have that sustains us through some of the speed bumps of life. I was a friend of mine, a, a friend named Jim, who was a cancer patient. This is back in the 80s and 90s uh, when uh, treatments could not be as exact and targeted as they are now. And he was having both... Uh, um, um, radiation and uh, chemotherapy. And one of the effects of that, uh, especially those days, was that it does, it, it's, it, it hurts the reproduction of your skin. 
and uh, your skin becomes brittle and dry and sores don't heal as well. And, and that part of your body that has the most often replaced skin, which is your throat, and your mouth, and your whole gut, really suffers uh, under the toxins of chemotherapy. And for him, he said, it's like my whole mouth is filled with hot sand. So I said, and, and he said, you know what my thought is, that what, what keeps me going is the thought of a big, juicy hamburger. And he named a place that it was from. It certainly wasn't one of the big box places. where It's not the hamburgers that are juicy. It's all the glop they put on it. But, you know, with some of the places that, and, and that used to serve really good hamburgers that were so juicy and, and warm and flavorful. And that, that was a vision that got him through the day. It helped him through the difficult parts of his journey. Now, this is a little hope because... And it's important that we know this little because it's not as powerful as the hope that we need. Little hopes generally do not withstand the harshest trials of life. At some point, the reality of what we're going through becomes more, much, much, much more compelling than the reality we can imagine with that little hope. Little hopes are good and they're helpful, but Paul is talking about a hope that sustains through the worst conditions and the worst times. It's a hope that comes from God that cannot be broken. And to be honest with you, it is not a hope that makes you feel like you're on a mountaintop experience, like you've got this, like you're, 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 you're going to get through this fine. Oftentimes, it is a hope that is just enough for that moment, that you don't give up hope. Uh, but this hope, the hope that he gives is sustainable. It is rock solid. It is at the basement level of the hole that has been dug in your life. And that's what you're standing on, that hope. Sustaining hope is a bedrock of assurance that keeps us alive inside for better days. There was a time when God gave me a Bible verse to hold on to it many times. But one in particular most recently when I needed something sustaining, and it was from Psalm 115, verse 1. And it goes, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness and because of your truth. Again, the glory of God, when God does what, what makes him feel good about himself, it means loving kindness transmitted to creation and a faithfulness. And how that can be true in a world that is like the one we're in is difficult to see or to understand at any given moment, but it is true. God isn't the author of evil. As a matter of fact, evil is about the only thing in our life's experience that doesn't need God to explain its existence. We carry it about in us. We carry it about in all the things that we do. It's like an infection we bring with us everywhere. But the hope that we have in God and in his glory is that things are going to work out in a way that he, every piece of wreckage that is left when it's over, he will rebuild. And that what he rebuilds will be better than what you had. It's hard to believe that and trust in that, but if you can get to that place, you can survive the day. It is, it's this verse, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory, because, again, because of your loving kindness and because of your truth, which really would be better translated because of your faithfulness, your integrity in your promises to us. That is a, it's an expansion, an amplification of what Jesus taught us to pray when he said, lead us, <laughs> your kingdom come, your will be done. When all my smaller visions of hopes were powerless, this word assured me that when God glorifies himself, his loving kindness and his faithful commitment to all believers becomes a blessing to them, including me. I could pray when, I, when that verse, and I meditated on that verse, and it said it in a new way that somehow captured the need, the deepest need of my heart. 
I could pray then, your kingdom come, your will be done, with all of my heart. The cost of it was that I had to abandon the dreams I had. The dream I had for the short run, and the dreams I had for the long run, because the future looked so dark and so dismal that I couldn't see. And I couldn't imagine that anything would be good enough and powerful enough to stand as an antidote or as a healing event for what I was facing in that moment. But if I had to abandon my dreams, I also needed to abandon and renounce my fears. Because if God's glory means loving kindness in the broadest possible terms, thinks about God's loving kindness going out as far as you can and realize that his loving kindness will go out farther than that, that, that from God's perspective, all of the evil of this world since the beginning of time, all that death has done, and he has not closed, he has not closed his eyes to any of it. We can turn the channel, turn the volume off, or change the channel and listen to some happy music or go to uh, something that makes us feel better about the place we're in. God sees and it goes through all that his creation is experiencing. And he has determined that all of that sorrow and suffering is worth it because of what he is about to accomplish. Starting with what he started with when Jesus was resurrected from the grave and being completed when he creates all things new. It's all going to be worth it. And it can be worth it here and now. I abandoned my dreams and I abandoned also my fears. And I trusted that God would one day feed me on his dreams that I couldn't see. Which he has done. But God doesn't want us to live only on what he has already said. He wants us to pay attention to what he is saying and what he is doing here and now. Train yourself to listen for him. He speaks to us in every word of truth that comes our way. Truth from a Christian friend, truth from experience, and the truth of his spirit. Train yourself to look for his presence in the lives of brothers and sisters in Christ. Train yourself to look for his spirit calling out to you in the interruptions that he puts in our lives to meet with him to serve others, to interrupt our day, to put down for a moment our agenda, even <clears throat> an agenda that in the broader sense is part of what God has called us to do. To put it down and pay attention to what the Holy Spirit has asked us to do for this moment in this day. Train yourself to look for his presence all around you and the opportunity he gives to serve others in any act of self-sacrificing love. This makes him more real and it awakens his heart and his spirit in us. And that, I promise you, awakens hope that is beyond any other hope that you might have about what your future would hold. Start by believing that God is at work around you. Expect to see the evidence of his presence and expect him to call on you to join him in that work. That is the hope of his calling. Paul also wanted us to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now the way this sentence is written, it can have two meanings. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the commentaries on it, you'll find that some commentaries take one meaning, some take the other, some of them take both. It can mean that our inheritance in God that we receive will be rich and glorious. But it can also mean that we are God's inheritance. That when he has done with us what he has imagined from the beginning of time that he is going to do, we will be a people that he rejoices in so greatly that it will make the cross seem a price worth paying to inherit us as his people. What a vision. You want a positive self-image? There it is. 
The New Testament supports both interpretations, which may be why Paul allows for both meanings in this particular sentence. We are God's inheritance, and he is our inheritance. Paul prays that we would know the riches of being God's inheritance, of being God's reward for all of this. If we are so highly valued, bearing in mind what he is making us into, then self-loathing and shame is not an option. And you have no more right to stay. The moment of revelation that, that we call shame that reveals something that needs to be addressed, confessed, and repented of, that is the use of shame. But any, any lingering, any, any life's work that, that's surrounded by shame, once you have repented of it and given that to God and, and been obedient to him, hey, listen, there's no option. When you call yourself a name, and I, I, I can't help but think of a time that I was at the school over here years ago. I can't remember why I was in a classroom visiting, maybe visiting a teacher. Maybe it was visiting Larry. I don't know. Uh, but one of the kids in the classroom at the time was one of our young people, uh, probably 10, 11, 12 years old at that time. And the family has since moved and left uh, the state altogether. But he was, ref I, I caught him in a moment of reflection and self-recrimination on something that he had done or said that was part of a theme of his life. And he was, un he was so sad about it and, and so ashamed of it. And he was sitting there just going, stupid, stupid, stupid. It's no good, and it is no better or more acceptable for us to say that about ourselves Jeez. than it is for us to say that about our children, someone else's children, or someone else. We gosh, what a picture. We are God's children. We are his reward for what he's gone through all of this accomplish. Our opinion of ourself needs to reflect that and we need to renounce anything that would hold us captive to what God is taking us away from and out of. Our opinions of others, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, must be characterized also by patience and respect and kind intentions since they too are God's inheritance. That the riches of receiving God's inheritance is, as they say in the credit card, priceless is another thing that should, should be a forefront in our, our, our uh, consciousness. The glory of our inheritance in the saints. The, the Apostle John tells us the vision he had of our inheritance in God in the Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will, be no, lo there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. The wiping of tears suggests that the healing that will come will be the healing of those hurts and sorrows and losses that we have already experienced. The ones that we thought went so deep that our soul could never truly recover from it. And God will find a way to bring healing. Do you want to know what it would be like to live with God? And a little taste of it right now, then I can I just suggest that you read the life story of Jesus in one of the Gospels. I can't possibly summarize it here, but he speaks with authority. He acts with love. He sees through all hypocrisy as lies. And he hears and he listens when hurting people call out for help and when weary people ask for honest questions, ask honest questions about real life concerns. 
He is that kind of God. And that's the God who's revealed in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of God that we're going to be spending eternity with. Living with him will be the greatest joy of all the joys present to us that we will know in all of our inheritance. So Paul is saying, finally he says, he prays that we would know the surpassing greatness of his power. In our world system, power is thought up in terms of wealth or the ability to accumulate stuff. It's known as, power is known in, the, in technology and in engines, and the power there is expressed in terms of horsepower or speed. And it's also known the power over other people, that is, the power that we have to leverage death in our favor, to develop weapons that are particular or that are, in general, killing machines. Spiritual power, the power that Paul wants us to know about, is measured by its ability to conquer death, not to deal it out, and to create life. Its greatest achievement is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of our own resurrection. It is to free us from slavery. It is to train us to stop thinking and behaving as slaves. In AA, they have a term called dry drunk, where, where you have managed to get sober by the sheer force of will, but your life still is a misery and, and, and isn't worth staying sober for. And, and that's the, the goal of Celebrate Recovery is to, is to build a life that is worth being sober for, to, to break the chains of slavery. And this is a slow work as opposed to when you think of power being speedy and immense and all of a sudden, this is slow work. The, the work of God weaves out all the tendrils of the cancer of sin in us so that we remain and God can renew and strengthen us. It is deep. It is life-giving. God glories in reshaping brokenness into beauty, turning confusion into insight, and strengthening misgiving into hope. This is the glory. This is how God feels good about himself, to create this for his creation. Even Jesus' own scars have become marks of greatness and joy because of the power of his great love and the loving effect of his great power. In the conclusion, I want to end where I started, back in Romans 6. The question is, will we stick with Jesus and grow in the newness of life that he promises, or do we go back? Do we see baptism and other religious rituals as an end to God's claim on our life? We finally we do, all right, God, I'm going to church, I'm going to take communion, I'm going to get baptized, I'm going to read the Bible, and then get off my back, I want my life back. I've done what you wanted. I want to move ahead. <coughs> See, baptism and all of the other disciplines of the Christian life as a, as a search for God, an exploration through faith into his goodness, waiting on him for the next growth, regardless of where it takes us, this newness of life, or do we give up and go back to what we knew? Suppose I had a terminal illness and my life was limited to being bedridden and that the only amusement I had to relieve my depression and the monotony was to play video games from my bed. For years I lived in a shadow life of make-believe in a video game. My pretend life was exciting in a way because the graphics and the sound and the emotional thrill evoked by the game was clever and engaging until I got used to it. But I took no real breaths in that make-believe world, and I touched no real people, nor did they touch me there. I was alone, and the only purpose I had was to fight fake enemies and build empires that would last only until I turned the machine off and the game was over. Now suppose a doctor came along, and he came and he healed me. And for the first time in my life, I had hope for a future. I had energy and vitality and a will to do something real and significant. I entered a world full of real people, of real challenges, of real breaths, of real air. 
a world that I couldn't control like my digital shadows, but one filled with brilliant sunshine, terrifying thunderstorms, impassable mountains, wide, wide stretches of cold water, and real people. Suppose the doctor offered to make me his apprentice, to teach me how to help him heal others like me, to help as he took them out of the shadows and into a future that was full of joy and true purpose. Suppose he took me to his home, the home he lived in, and showed me a land and a piece of property so beautiful that I ached to enter into it. Suppose he told me that if I would serve him now and become his apprentice and enjoy his friendship, that this would be my home as well. Now suppose I told him, no thanks, I've done everything that you've asked me to do, now go away and leave me to live my own life. I've gotten pretty good at the games, I'm at level 42, I want to see where it ends. That's the kind of lunacy that Paul is talking about. That's why he gets so worked up about it. Why would you want to go back, he's saying. He's not, he's not chiding you and scolding you for wanting. He's, he's, he's astonished or astounded. Why do you want to go back to the misery that you had? You need to go forward. And if you're hungry along the way, if you feel alone, if you feel stretches where the, I want more out of life, well, hang in there. Embrace the hunger because God is going to give more. But you have to wait on him because the only life worth having is the life that he gives. You don't want to go back to the rest of it because as passionate as it might have been, it led nowhere but to death. That's how the end always happened. Everything you did was meaningless on the way and it ended in death at the end. Why go back? Why in the world would we give up everything for nothing? If you haven't started your journey with Jesus yet, the greatest of all doctors and all healers, then you could start today. You could start now. There's only one time. That's now. The time for action. Everything else is a lie. Everything else is an excuse. There's now. If you haven't started with the journey, then begin it now. What does it take? There's no magic words. It's all from your heart, but put it into words. The best ones you can think of. I would suggest to you two things. First of all, that what you want is the life that Jesus has, yes. And on the way to that, you want him as your savior to save you out of life. And if you don't know what you need to be saved from, then you're not ready for this. So just, we're almost done. Go to your happy place. Think of a juicy hamburger. But if you look at your life and you're not happy and you know what you've, what you've been able to accomplish at the best and it's not enough, then ask Jesus to save you from your own best efforts, not, let alone and also your worst ones. But if you're going to ask him to be your savior, then you have to ask him to be your Lord. Preachers like me always used to say this gift of salvation is free. And, and technically that's true. <clears throat> Because you have, you and I have nothing that's valuable enough to purchase it from God. But what we do have, the rags that we have, the tatters of who we are, that has to be given to him. It's not free. Everything that we are, such as it is, and we don't think of ourselves, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't think of ourselves as much of a treat right now, especially when we finally turn to God. It's because we've screwed something up so badly but he sees what he's going to make. He sees who you're going to be. He sees the friendship that we're going to have with him throughout eternity, and he acts on that. Make it be now. Ask him to be your Lord. Ask him to be your Savior. Surrender who you are to who he is. You won't regret it. Give up the wages you earn for yourself, and instead, focus on all that Jesus has saved up to give you as a gift. If that is your desire, I'm going to pray in a minute here, and if that's your desire and your prayer, if it's a decision you've made in your heart to say, I'm, I'm done, be my own God, and you surrender to Jesus Christ, then think about making 
baptism. If you, or if you've done that in the past and you've never been baptized, hey, it's, it's a unique experience. If you haven't enjoyed it yet, uh, come on in. Like, like the movie, uh, Brother, Where Art Thou? You know, come on in, fellers, the water's fine. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous experience, and uh, I know you won't regret it. Celebrate with the act, the dramatic act of prayer that we call uh, baptism by just coming to watch as others are being baptized to rejoice with them and with heaven, or come in and get wet yourself. Let's pray. Lord God, for every heart here that wants to surrender to you, I just let them pour themselves into this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm tired of being the God of my life. I want you to be the Savior, and I want you to be my Lord, and I'm ready to give it all to you. Hear my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Lord God, we pray that you would bring about revival in this world. We desperately need it, and, and truthfully, it's one of the most dire situations we've been in, both the chaos within and without. Uh, it just, it, it's, uh, it, it's overwhelming. So I, I pray, Lord Jesus, that in this day, that you would please grant us this prayer, that there would be at least one last revival that you would let us be a part of. If it, if it, it, we would love to see it be from sea to shining sea and around the world, but if it's just in our neighborhood, Lord, that would be so much and enough. And make us part of it, Lord God. For I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pull out your hymnal and, and turn to number 473, Victory in Jesus. And you can stand with me and sing because, because we ought to. <laughs> I heard an old, old story How my Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His glory Of His precious blood with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard of his cleansing power. My Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He 
plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.